God is so good. I want to share our scripture with you and then we'll be seated. We're going to Romans chapter 8, verse 32. We've got some other folks we want to say hi to. We're going to read this scripture and then I'll let you be seated. And we'll, then we'll take care of some business here. Romans 8 and 32, the amplified version says this. He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously, graciously give us all things? Lord, we ask that you would touch and move today and minister, Lord, through your word. Lord, your presence has been here since the beginning, God, and you've moved and touched, and your presence is so thick. God, we ask that you would have your way, Lord, in, in this word and in this preaching. Lord, we ask that you just touch every heart, touch every life, every ear, and God, we pray that you would make the difference as we honor you and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. As you're being seated, I wanted to say, uh, as you have figured out, I'm sure already, Pastor Ray, uh, last week he took off and went to Europe. He is not from Harlem, but he is a globetrotter. He uh, has spent the last several days, uh, which he is still there, he is in Europe. Uh, he went there to see his nephew graduate from a college there. Him and Sister Carolyn, who was here last week, did such a wonderful job. They have been there, and uh, if you have any social media, you have followed his journey step by step. It's, we're uh, happy for them. Also, you saw that Pastor Gary uh, wasn't here, and I want to appreciate so much Tyler and the team for the worship this morning. <laughs> Gary is not traveling the world. He's just in Florida. Well, also, I wanted to appreciate Pastor Cam, but uh, Pastor Steve beat me to that, so that's cool. I was glad that they are here with the whole crew. And we could not go, yes, we appreciate them. You get, you get twice. That's awesome. Very cool. I wanted to uh, uh, especially acknowledge and welcome back home Pastor Austin and Cammie Lewis. You guys stand up for us. They are home. Uh, they're a home uh, from Oklahoma. They're there in prior doing a wonderful work being the youth pastors. And of course, we have to welcome Parker, who is in the, uh, yes, he is right there with Grandma, right where he should be. Or, I don't know if it's a boy or girl. I messed that up. I don't know if it's a boy or girl, I confess. It's a boy, okay. But, all right. Well, it was good having you in church today, guys. Uh, no, never mind. Anyhow, today is an exciting day. Of course, it is Thanksgiving. It's a time when we can all get together. Friends and family come in from out of town, and we get to uh, take care of each other and look out for one another and love each other. Uh, Thanksgiving is one of those times of year where we really get to slow down, push back everything else, and really count our blessings. We get to think about what really matters in our life, our families, our friends, our health, the Lord, just all the good things, uh, they all come home at this time. Today I'm preaching a message, and it's called three, uh, it's 364 Peace, a Thanksgiving message. I want to share this prayer with you. It's a poem that I found. It says this, Dear God, we thank you for this special meal, for all the love and joy we feel. Bless our family, bless our friends, with your love that never ends. All our blessings, big and small, we give thanks for one and all. Amen. Amen. As I said, Thanksgiving is, is an exciting time. Now, I want to say this right as soon as we start. I know as soon as I start talking about the holidays, the second thing we think about is it's coming too quick. It's too fast, you know. I barely got done with summer, and now we're you know, cutting the turkey and putting up the Christmas tree. So for this message, we're going to be positive. We're not going to worry about the time, okay? We're not going to worry about how quick it's coming. We're just going to be positive, okay? Thanksgiving is a time we get to focus on all the good stuff. Our family, the food maybe, the fun, 
even football, maybe at your house. I know some people have a tradition where they even go hunting, like the morning of Thanksgiving, they get out, the family all comes together. It's a time where we break out all the traditions from the kid table to grandma's gravy boat. We have all these traditions, and it's such a good, blessed time. And it's a time where we get to be thankful. I have a, a rhetorical question. Well, maybe it's a literal question. I don't know. Do you have a time at your house where you go around the table and say what you're thankful for? Do you do that? Any, let me see your hands. Does anybody do that? Okay. Probably about half of us. We have something like that at my house, except it's where we can, everybody takes a turn complaining. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm just joking. Uh, maybe I'm not. At, at one time. But anyhow, we have that moment where we get to just talk about what's so great about life. We are blessed to be able to share these things. One of the things that, that is so cool to be thankful for is family. You get to be thankful for another year with your loved ones or Maybe you get to go back and reflect on the memory of somebody. Maybe they're not with you this year, but you're thankful for them and that you got to have them in years past. Marriages are a big thing at Thanksgiving. We have the, the person that shows up that got married this summer, and they're like, you know, you ask them, how are you doing? You're six months in. Is everything still good? And, you know, those kind of comments. There's also something really cool that happens is around the holidays is when people start getting serious. You know, getting serious with the boyfriend and the girlfriend. Uh, they have to come to dinner, have to come to Thanksgiving and face the, the firing squad, so to speak, for the first time. You know, show up and get all the questions and listen to all the embarrassing stories and all those things. I can remember the first time, kind of the first time we had a, me and my wife had like a serious date. I forget the timing, but, I, you know, I show up at the house and I think my mother-in-law took a picture of us and... At that time, I looked like I was in front of the firing squad or, or, or like I was caught in the act of stealing or something. I was just like in the picture. And my wife, her expression on her face is a big smile like, Lord, let this go good or something, you know. Those things happen. Another thing that happens around Thanksgiving is we bring the new babies. You know, everybody gathers around, see how they're growing. And, and you know, of course, the baby's going to be dressed up like a turkey or something like that. If you're, if you're a little bit older of a kid, you're the guy that gets the, uh, oh, you're growing up so big. Hey, tiger, you're growing up so big. You know, you get those things. But it's time for family. It's time for us to be thankful for family. Time to be thankful about Jesus. Time to be thankful about our jobs and what the future will hold. It's time to be thankful for our freedom, for our health. Maybe there's a new house or a new car, something in our life to be thankful for. And we get to focus on those things on Thanksgiving, what our life is full of, those great gifts that we've been given. It's what it's all about. It's the one day that we get to remember. And if you're like me, there's a moment during Thanksgiving. I thought about it, and I think my moment during Thanksgiving when it all comes home to me is we, typically everybody comes to my house. We eat like on the... Uh, eat in the living room, dining room, that kind of thing. And, but for some reason at my house, my stove, my oven that wor works is downstairs in the basement. So I'm the one that goes down with the rolls and puts them in the oven and brings them up. Well, my moment is somewhere I come downstairs and I'm <laughs> searching for a towel or something to take the, the rolls out of the oven because, of course, I forgot to bring something to do that with. So... I've got a dirty towel that I'm holding everybody's food with. <laughs> but I have this moment where I can hear all my family upstairs, and everything d comes together for me. And it's a joyful, peaceful time. And that's the moment I get to reflect and say, man, I'm, I'm so blessed. And I know you have those moments, too. Sometimes it, the older couple is sitting at the head of the table, and there's all this chaos going on, and you just look around, you're like, I can't believe all this because, you know, a couple of kids fell in love 50 years ago. But there's that moment of fulfillment, that moment of peace that happens on Thanksgiving. We really focus on all the great things. But today I want to 
talk about those things, but I want to look at the other 364 days. Because there's some tough times out there that we go through and we have to deal with. The winter gets long. Summer months get hot and frustrating. We start to get into a place where we switch and we start to write a different list. And this list is not full of the blessings, but it's full of some other things. Things like what I have and what they have. A list of I wish full of the latest and the greatest. Or we have a list of tough times that have happened in my life. And we're going to talk about tough times a little bit more in detail later. We get frustrated. We get disappointed over time. We find ourselves wanting more than what we have. And in the process, slowly the, the peace of a good day like Thanksgiving wanes. And it gets, uh, gets a different uh, situation. We could just, if we could just have more, then things would be okay. Now today is, like I said, today is going to be a positive day, so we're going to keep it up. But we just have, if we, things would be better if we just had more time. If I just had more time, if everybody wasn't pulling on me from left to right, if I had more time, things would be okay. If I had more money, if, well, if I just had more money, I could make all these problems go away. If I just had more money. Another big one is cooperation. If those people would just listen to me for once, if they would just be smart enough to listen to me and cooperate, then we could get some stuff done. If they would just listen, those things end up frustrating us. And if we're not careful, we'll start chasing things out of frustration. Frustration is a great motivator, especially when we can do it ourselves. And the enemy really likes when we can do it ourselves. We get focused on what we don't have instead of what we do have. And in the process, we get robbed of our peace. This vicious cycle takes over because we think if we'll grab this and if we can attain more and get more, then that will be our peace, but only to pull it back and figure out that that didn't bring me the peace. And then we claw and reach for the next thing, and here that doesn't satisfy us either. If we work harder for money and get a bigger house, etc., but the disappointments keep going until it's the next big thing. 1 Timothy says this, 1 Timothy 6 and 17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to, get, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Amen. Some people would, if I said that to certain people, they say, oh, no, that's not in the Bible. That nothing like, God doesn't say, you know, he's going to richly take care of us or something like that. No. But listen, it says, hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides. That means he's not saying, oh, you're going to be rich, but you're going to be richly provided for that there is a source where the riches come from and who takes care of us, and it's God who provides us with everything to enjoy. Uh, there are some people that would say, God doesn't even care about what you enjoy or what you don't, you know. But I'm telling you, that's what the Word says. He cares for us. He's there to take care of us and look out for us. He's there. If we're not careful, the blessings and everything that God's given us We'll get distracted by what's happening in life and we'll start straining towards something else. And in the midst of that, we'll sacrifice our peace. I want to share this testimony. I said a little bit of this last week. I talked about the year of restoration. You know, at, in January we started this thing and we started talking about the year of restoration. And I, God has restored, so to speak, several things in my life. And I know from all the hands and the testimonies last week, God has done some things in your life and he's restored some things this year for you as well. But he's not done yet. Amen? He's still, he, if, if we're going to hold him to the calendar, which we, you know, we're, we're not necessarily allowed to do, but we still got four or six weeks for God to finish what he started, the year of restoration. In the middle of this uh, year, earlier this year kind of, 
I ran on some hard times. I want to share this testimony with you. I come upon some hard times and some challenges that that had to do with my uh, finances. I found myself in a place where I'm like worried a lot. How are we gonna How are we gonna survive? How are we gonna pay for this? How pay for that? You know, we've we've experienced some life changes and some uh, economic hardship due to the economy, which I know that you're aware of. So there was times when I was struggling and I, I was praying about it, and I'm like, God, I I know that you can take care of this, but but I was really praying about it a lot, really worried about it a lot. So one day in particular, I was. Uh, praying it's in my backyard, sitting on the back porch, and I was praying about it. Out of the blue, the Lord spoke to me, and He said, "Have I given you second best?" He said, "When I gave you your son, He said, is he second best?" You know, and for all the parents in the room, trust me, I, we both know what this means. Uh, for me, yeah, he's the best. I I love my son. He said, "Okay." What about the rest of your life? So I started to go down this list of the other blessings in my life, my wife, this church, uh, my calling, my friends, my family, all those things. I'm like, you haven't given me second best in any of the things. He said, okay. So if I've given you the best, then stop complaining because you're making me look bad. (laughs) And I was like, Yes, sir. But I started to think through all the blessings in my life and what I've been given. It's humbling. It's very humbling. So a couple of things happened when he told me. Number one, it humbled me, and it helped me to focus back on, hey, this is what I've given you, now do something with it. But it also kept me from doing something else that I, I didn't realize, you know, in the moment but it kept me from chasing something that wasn't going to bring my peace anyway. You know, he was, he was saying, hey, you're going about this the wrong direction. And I couldn't see it in the moment, but he was helping me out. He was giving me the 364 piece that I needed in my life. He was taking care of me. We have been given so many great things, including Christ. God has given us his best. Amen. Romans 8 and 32 says this, what we read earlier. He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? The greatest peace we could ever know is him. He fulfills our life. Chasing after him fulfills everything inside of us. Somebody might say, well, yeah, he, you know, yeah, God, that's the right answer. He takes care of everything, but that doesn't keep the heat on in my house. Well, I'm here to tell you, he can take care of that too. He can take care of you. So along with that testimony and that story, I, I, I turn the mirror back on you, and I say, look at your life. You're going to take some time over the next few days, and you're, you're going to look at what matters so much what your life has been blessed with, your, your family, your friends, the opportunities that you've been given. You have those things in your life to today because God has blessed you with them. And He's given them to you. He is here to take care of you and to love you and to provide for you and to bless your life. He cares for you enough that He would think through the details of your life and plan it all out. He would put the right people together at the right time, the right purposes. He loves you so much that he's invested like that. We think that, you know, we're just doing thing and doing our thing and trying to invite God into the middle of it. Oh, no. God's blessed you. He's given you life. He's given you so much. He's there to take care of you. Let's talk about something specific for a second. Let's talk about your family. Now, every family's unique. And every family has unique people in it, right? And, and like, like we've said before, and like I like to share, if, you know, every family has one weird person, you know? 
And if you show up and you look around and everybody's pretty normal, <laughs> sorry, you, you might, that might be you, I don't know. But every family is unique. Some are a joy to be around. And some frustrate you. Some people have it all together, but some people don't. Some people are broken. But I want you to know that God's put you there. They need you. They need your love. Newsflash, you need them. Doesn't matter if your family split, if it's big, if it's small, if everybody's black sheep or if they're not. Your family's a gift. And there's a purpose for your family. There's a purpose for you to be there, to make a difference, to love people, to care for them, and see what God's going to do. Out of God's love, He's given you your family. What else has He blessed you with? Because you were blessed. You were blessed more than you realize. I'm blessed more than I realize. How are we blessed? You're blessed with the home you have, the job, the car. You're blessed with tomorrow if you make it there. You're blessed with your health. You're blessed with enough mental clarity to be able to make a decision when you need to make a decision. How about this? You can still dream. You can still dream about what, what will tomorrow hold? What's God going to do? And what, what's God got in store for my life? You can still dream. I'm sorry, my nose is running for some reason. Check this out. I, I was praying one day and I thought of this and it came to me so strong. It's so simple and so small, but yet it makes such an impact. You are blessed right now because there's air in your lungs. The air in your lungs that you're blessed with is giving you life. The air in your lungs is going to give you the, the ability to tell the most important person in your life that you love them. The air in your lungs is going to be what you're able to share Jesus with someone by. The breath in your lungs can be your prayer. It's so simple, but yet the impact is so great. And I felt the Lord bring that to me. Something so small, but the impact be so great. We're blessed. We're blessed. And God's taking care of us. Ministering to us in wonderful ways. So you see what's going on here, right? You get it. See, the enemy keeps us so busy chasing things that steal our peace and chasing the next thing that we, that we think is going to get our peace, that we get distracted. We get our focus off the blessings and on other things and keeps us busy from serving the purpose of what those things are about. So my challenge today is that we settle the issue. Settle the issue of who's going to be first in your life and that it's God no matter what. Because out of the relationship that you have with Him, that provider will give you everything that you need. He won't waste a gift that He's given you if you give it back to Him. He's got a purpose. He's got a design for you. Now, I want to share this with you. I did this a little different the first service. But I want to share the parable of the talents with you. This is in Matthew chapter 25, and this actually falls in where Jesus is giving uh, several examples of the end times and how life is going to be at the end of, you know, the end of creation. And this parable of talents is he, he, he tells this story. He says it'll be for, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his ability, then he went away. He who received the five talents got five more talents. He who got the two talents invested it, traded it, and got two more talents. But the guy who had one talent, he took the talent, 
and made an excuse, found a reason, and he took the one talent that he was given and buried it in the ground and waited for the master to come back. And when the master came back, he saw what each one had done, loved them, rewarded them, took care of them. And when it came to the last one, he was judged harshly because what he was given, he didn't do anything with. He said on it. So this, if you're familiar with this story, when you hear this story, it kind of has this, yikes, kind of a negative vibe. But we're trying to be positive today, so we're going we're gonna to look at this a different way. We're going to keep it positive. So when I hear this story, I have a, it's doom and gloom, and the, the last servant is cast out into utter darkness where there'll be uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, it's, it's hell, it's punishment, it's dark. But I got to looking at this story like, step back from it, see the big picture. Right from the outset, I saw this story from a different perspective. Because seeing it in a different way, the master and the servants and the cast out in the darkness, we, you know, master and servants, you know, that just sounds like, ooh, that's bad. That's... But really, when you look at it, the master had servants at his house, but the master provided for the servants. He gave them a house. He gave them food. He took care of them. The, he gave them life. So when we see that, it's not like well, ma- the master in the story is really the Lord. And the Lord provided for the servants and took care of them. In the big picture, the master provided the whole life for the servants. Not only did he provide for them everything they needed, but he had a relationship with them enough to trust them and to give them money. He trusted them and gave them the talents. He had a relationship with them to be able to say, I'm going to give this much to you and this much to you and this much to you. He trusted them. He gave them his riches and was like, hey, I'll be back. So we see this relationship. They were very close, you know, looking at it from the the positive side. Wow. He was really there and provided everything for those guys and took care of them. And if nothing else, when we looked at it, there's three servants. Two of them got it right and one of them different, didn't. So the odds are good. Two out of three. You can laugh there. Or you don't have to. No worries. We're being positive. I'm laughing on the inside. So we see the, parable, the parallel between the lives of the servants and us. They were given gifts. They were good stewards of the gifts that they were loaned. The gifts were multiplied then through their stewardship. And then they were rewarded for their efforts. But I want us to dig deeper inside of these things because I think in our life, when we're going through everyday life, we feel it different. We see it different. We think of things differently. But I believe that God, through His Scriptures, knows exactly where we are. He knows exactly how we feel about them. He knows exactly what we need. And He gives us things like this story that apply directly to our life that will help us. So let's dig into this story a little bit and pull out a few of these details. We could talk about this forever, but we don't have forever. So the talents. Right away, talking about the talents, I read where one of the talents was equal to 20 years salary. That's a lot. So in our terms, if if let's say servant A made $50,000 a year, that would be that times 20, that's what he got which is a million dollars. The first servant, the first servant that got one talent got a million dollars. The second servant that got two talents, he got two million dollars. And the guy that got five, got five. So what does that mean? That means that when God provides for you, that number one, he'll give you what you need. You know, I think sometimes we see this parable of talents and we think, you know, he was passing out pennies to the servants. He wasn't passing out pennies. He was passing out his fortune to them. God provides for us, and He will give us what we need. What He's given to us has a purpose and a plan. He didn't give them something and say, hey, protect this and watch over this. He said, no, here's something of value. Take that, use that, bless it, be a good steward of it, and it has power to multiply. It has value to it that will increase if you'll pour into it, meaning it's like your family. Where you have placed has potential. Not only do they have value, they have value, 
but they have potential for growth in there. That means there's a hope when it comes to your family. It's not hopeless. The enemy would say, well, your family's kind of hopeless. No, there's a hope because God's in the middle of it. He's placed you where you are. He loves your family, and he does things that grow, and there's potential for it to grow. What do your prayers do? Even if you prayed, let's say you just pray over your family, what could your prayers do? Or what could your words of encouragement do? There's uh, Me and my wife were thinking about somebody that's kind of connected to our family, and we don't know exactly how they grew up, but we got to talking about it one day, and we thought, we wonder if anybody's ever taken the time to appreciate them or, or tell them as they were growing up, hey, you've done a good job. Good job. Man, I'm proud of you. I wonder if anybody's ever done that with them and what difference that could make. What about your situation? People in your family, what could you say or do to just love them and help them, invest in them just a little bit that would add value to them, but ultimately add value to the kingdom and give glory to God? If we'll take the little, what we're given and invest in it, what a difference it can make. Observation of the talents. Another observation I made is about the master. The master doesn't change from person to person. There's a lot of times in life when the enemy tells us, well, God just likes them better. He just loves them better. They're just special, and you're not on that list, so sorry. But I'm here to tell you, the master loves every one of us the same. The master doesn't change from one person to the next. He loves us unconditionally, and when you really get down to it, it is in our favor he loves us. The scales are tipped in our favor every time. Another thing, the, another thing that, that I observed is the master doesn't change. You might say, well, if the master is the same with everybody, why do you give some, some so much and some so little to the others? Well, this is the reason why. He's not changing, but we are. We are different. He knows that we're different. And he's close enough to this. He was close enough to the servants, and he's close enough to us to know what we could handle and what we can't. He knows what's going to keep us on track and what won't. The amounts don't show his non love, the amounts actually show how much he does love us. But with each of the amounts, the expectation is not the same either. He expects something different from each one depending on the amount he's given. The enemy also likes to tell us, hey, you got to do this because that person was able to uh, win 50,000 people to the Lord and travel the world. You have to do that. No, you don't necessarily have to do that. You just have to do what the Lord's called you to do. What, what has he called you to do? What has he called you to do? And last, let's talk about the last servant. We're going to keep it positive, so we're going to say this is a, we're going to talk about him as a cautionary tale. So when you look at him, you see a few things. Number one, he was provided for everything just like everybody else. The master took care of him. The master understood his situation and said, he can't handle the five, but I want him to have this one. He can do something with this one. So he got the one. But he didn't do anything. The, the, the master said, well, at least invest, you know, you could have at least invested the one and got a, an, an interest from the bank and you had had something, but he wouldn't even do that. He did the least. And if you think about it, the servant was already at the master's house. He already ate the food. He took the bed. He already cost the master something. So he actually didn't just not do something with the money that he was given. He actually consumed the whole time the master was gone. It actually cost the master and when it all came down there was no legitimate excuse that the servant could give him he, act, he tried to say it was this he tried to say it was that he tried to even blame the master and say hey I know how you are so, so bro I just hit it he'd come up with every excuse but there was none because the master knew exactly who the servant was who he was, how he felt, how he lived life and there was no excuse. And he said, I'm sorry, man, and put him out. So keeping it positive, let's look at it this way. There's really no reason at all this story could have ended completely different. And there could have been no, no negative vibe to it at all. 
it was really just the last guy's choice. He had everything in his favor, every gift, every blessing, everything they could use to be a success, and he just didn't. That's tough. That's tough. But you see those servants, they're provided for. They were given riches. And when they were given those riches, they did something with it. It grew, it multiplied, it was blessed. And at the end of their lives, they got the reward. And the, and the Lord put this story in the Scriptures because He wants to bring that to us. To love Him first and to give Him our hearts, give Him our lives, and depend on Him as God, the provider. Not just God on Sunday, but God of our life and God of our heart. And He provided and blessed them in a wonderful way. God has given you your gifts and He's blessed you. I want to share, uh, I have a story, but I have to say this one thing. And this is something that God took me to and I landed on and I have to give it to you. And it's, you know, on a positive day, maybe this is a little rough, but I got to do what the Lord told me to do. When we talk about the Lord providing, we're like, yeah, the Lord provides. He gives, yeah, He takes care of us. So what will happen is we'll be like, okay, God, I know you can take care of us. Now come on, take care of me. Come on, God. Now. All right. Come on, God. I, I trust you. Let's, let's get those blessings rolling. Come on. Yeah. Come on, Lord. So that brings me to this point. I believe that God's looking at you and saying this. I am faithful. I am going to take care of you. But that's not the question. The question is really, are you going to trust me? I know, that's harsh. <laughs> so I want to share this last story with you, and, and this is going to go a couple different ways. But uh, just a few weeks ago, I took uh, me and my wife. Uh, so we jumped in a U-Haul and took supplies to uh, Tennessee for the hurricane victims. All of you folks blessed the, uh, those folks with bottles of water, you name it. Everybody came out and brought a truckload of supplies that we took to Tennessee and uh, donated your finances, your time. And we grabbed all that stuff. And a, a beautiful team of folks grabbed that stuff and packed a truck full. And we took it to Tennessee and uh, blessed Operation Compassion with that, who then took it and blessed the people of North Carolina with it that have went through the hurricane. And I would just want to say uh, how incredibly impressed the people at Operation Compassion were with your gifts and with your giving. Um, they looked at the stuff uh, that people had donated like it was gold. They were like, this stuff is perfect. They, they were like, how did you know to get this, this, and this? And, and I was like, well, somebody from the church, you know, our team went online and found a list of just the right things. And they were like, this stuff is great. Tell the church, thank you so much. This is perfect. And uh, so that stuff was kind of organized and then sent out on semis the next day. And that's been three or four weeks ago. So the people all over North Carolina have already received that. So thank you very much for your gift and for the difference that you made. The, the last thing I'll say about this particular part was they, they were like, man, this stuff is great. I looked at, looked at, there was three or four guys that were helping us, and I just said, well, you know, because you don't want to be like, oh, well, our church, you know, bless God, you know, we're, I just said, well, man, our people love to give, and every time something happens and we make the need known, they just come out and they make all the difference, and uh, I just think that's cool, and I appreciate everybody that's give, that gave. So what happened is, is I'm, I'm, a, I'm a road tripper. If somebody says, oh, we need something to go to Oklahoma, I'm like, hey, I'll volunteer. So I, I, I sniffed out just a little bit that somebody was taking this stuff to Tennessee, so I'm like, I want to be the one that takes this stuff to Tennessee. Guilty. I want to do it. So we loaded, you know, the team loaded up that truck, and we left the next morning and headed to Tennessee. And... Uh, I didn't know I was going to have a testimony out of it like this, but, but I want to share something with you that happened to me on the trip. We got down in the mountains somewhere. We're in this big 25-foot truck, you know, swinging back and forth through the mountains. And uh, 
my wife, whenever we go on a trip, at some point she's taking a nap during, you know, during the road trip. I take naps when we drive too, but uh, mine are a lot quicker. That's a joke. So we're going along, and she's like, I'm getting tired. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, she, she grabs a nap, and what happens is when she gets a nap, especially if I haven't had my prayer time that day, that's when I pray. So this particular day, she went to sleep, and I'm like, okay, rock and roll. We're going to pray. And uh, I started into praying, and instantly I felt the presence of the Lord. Just almost, you know, blew my mind. I felt him so strong. So the background to this story is we've kind of talked, to, talked about is the week before my father-in-law had passed away. And that was the same week as Winterfest, or not Winterfest, of, of uh, Family Fun Fest. So working that week, at the beginning of that week, I was like, this is going to be the longest week of my life. I'm going to preach my father-in-law's funeral on Saturday, and then Sunday we're going to have Family Fun Fest, which is a killer, you know. I mean, as far as like the energy and the time and all that. But at the beginning of that week, well, through that weekend, through that week, I felt the Lord's presence with me. I felt His strength. I felt His peace. I, f I felt it along with me, almost like I was riding a raft or something the whole week and just going by day by day. And it kind of culminated. We had, we had His death and so many other ones. It kind of culminated. I'm sitting in that U-Haul truck and I'm praying. I call out to the Lord. All of a sudden, I feel His presence. I feel His presence so strong, I'm, I'm like, I, I almost feel guilty that I feel the way I do because I feel so uplifted. The, the weights and the pressure of everything that, that would hold somebody down, I felt that ease and I felt light. <laughs> Almost to the point where I'm like, it doesn't even make logical sense that you're so good to me and this is the way I feel. The Lord spoke to me and He said, you put way too much pressure on people in situations. And when He said that, He was saying it to me, but He was saying it to people in general. He wanted me to share this with you. He said, you put way too much pressure. And what he was getting at is when you put so much pressure on somebody, they're bound to fail. They're bound to be frustrated and not live up to whatever you think that they should be. Even situations, they fall and they falter. So he said that to me. The next thing that came to my mind was 1 Peter 5 and 7. It says this, cast all your cares all your anxieties, all your worries, and all your concerns once and for all on Him. For He cares about you with the deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. He was so right. We hold people to such high expectations. We get frustrated over the order being wrong at the restaurant. So much pressure on our family and they didn't show up when you needed them to, so you're mad at them now and you question if they even care. You get mad at, you can't get mad at God, but you just get mad when the car won't start. And there the frustration is that leads down dark roads. We can live there as a habit. But are you tired of all that? Are you tired of the frust frustrations? Cast your cares on Him for He cares. See, he said, you put so much pressure on those things, but he said, you should be putting the pressure on me, meaning him, God. And when he said that, the, the pressure doesn't mean we need to put pressure on him, but dependence. We need to let him be our focus. And let him be our supply. And when, that is, when that's how things work, then he'll be the one that provides for us 364 days of peace. But I told you a, a little bit earlier, I said we were going to focus on tough times because tough times are the things that will get us off track quicker than anything else. 
before we're lusting over something out there, or before we're ticked off because somebody has something better than we do, tough times knock us off track. I want to talk about that. The second part of my testimony is this. When I was in that truck, we were going down 75. I was in the center lane, and the semis were going, we were going by semis on this side, and the fast lanes on this side. I was overwhelmed by his presence, and he said the thing about dependence, and he said the thing about casting our cares. The next scripture, I was like, this makes so much sense. The next scripture that came to my mind was Psalm 46 and 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. So I was in that center lane, and we were passing semis. I heard the Lord say that scripture to my heart, and then I said it out loud, and when I said it out loud, here we went by a semi, and Psalm 46 and 1 was wrote down the side of that semi in big letters. And it was like I was reading it off of that truck, but I was saying it before I even saw it. And I was like, are you kidding me? It was a real miracle. It was a miracle for, for so many reasons. It was a miracle of truth because the Word's alive and it knows exactly what to say. And it was a miracle of timing because it couldn't have happened any different. It was right at the right place at the right time. But not only just so I could read it and it would all come together that way, but it was a scripture of ti- it was a miracle of timing because it was what I needed at that moment. All of it came together. But look at this. I'm telling you this the the Lord writes the scripture because he knows he partly because he knows exactly how we think, how we would feel and what we go through. So let's look at this scripture, Psalm 46. Think of when bad things happen in your life. Whatever whatever that is, you know what that is. One of the things that happens is we we would just love to find that place of peace. You know, for some, it's they want to get around their grandkids. For others, you know, they want to go up in the mountains. Some people are like, oh, I just wish I had the beach right now. We long for this place. And look what this scripture says. God is our refuge. He will be the place that we can go to when the bad times happen. What's this, another thing that happens? When something bad happens, we always tell ourselves, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. Then comes the Scripture. God is our refuge and our strength. He is that ability. He is that strength that we need to get through that situation. Another thing that always happens when bad times come is we don't want to be alone. We need somebody. We need somebody to be there for us. Some people are petrified. I don't want to go through this alone. The Lord says that He is a very present help in the time of trouble. And think about it. This, this Scripture talks about the time of trouble, meaning that he is going to be right there at the right time. Now, the only, to me, the only open end, so to speak, on this whole scripture says God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in the time of trouble is that word help. I can't exactly trace that down to a definition that's that's going to apply to your situation when bad times come because only God knows what that's going to be. For me, He showed up with a scripture on the side of a semi going down 75. I don't know what it is that you'll need when times are tough because the bad times are going to come. I'd like to to tell you it's going to be something different in 2025, but somehow this messed up world is, is going to mess up your plans. But somehow God is going to help you. He knows right when to be there and how to be there to take care of you, to be that help when it all goes wrong and get you through it. You can trust Him. You can trust Him. You can trust Him for your next breath. You can trust Him when all hope is lost in this world. He can be your help. He wants to be your God. He wants to be your peace. Romans 8 and 28 says this, and we know 
that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. If you would, stand with me. So I just want to challenge you with this. That your life would change from here on out. That we focus on the good things and focus on God, number one. What this week we're going to make our list and, and celebrate and talk, you know, even if we don't physically make a list, you know, we're going to have it on our minds. I like to challenge us to keep the list for more than just today, more than just Thursday, but to wake up every day and remember, I'm, I'm blessed. And there, there are some days when it's hard to figure out, okay, now how blessed am I? Because I'm starting to forget it. But keep it in front of you. I challenge you this way. It might be hard to remember the whole list, but something really simple that you can do is remember to keep God first. Give Him your heart. Give Him your life. Give Him your love. <laughs> Every day, He'll take care of the list. He'll remind you of the list. He'll help you in the bad stuff, the good stuff. Your focus, your attention, keep it on Him. You have peace. Not, not just on Thanksgiving, not just on the highlights, but the rest of the year as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we honor You and praise You. All glory goes to You, Lord. You have given us life. God, you, you in your wisdom and in your love, you spoke us before we ever showed up on this earth, before we ever surprised our parents, before this life ever took place. God, you loved us enough to create us. Lord, we've shown up here and we're not just out here on our own chancing it with life. No, God, you, you've, you've blessed us with so much life and love and family and, and existence. God, you've blessed us with your Son. If we needed convincing, your Son coming would do it all. You love us so much and care for us so greatly. God, today we dedicate our lives to you, dedicate our hearts to you. God, and we give you first, Lord, because we want to know you. And we want to have that peace that, that comes out of this relationship with you. Lord, your abilities are able to take care of whatever comes our way. You're God. So we dedicate our lives to you. and We, we fall in line with you and say, God, we love you and have your way in our lives. Lord, we want to love and share and give everything you've given to us, Lord. We just appreciate your work and your hand. Lord, we honor you and thank you today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we want to give you an opportunity. Maybe your life is in a place where you don't have a relationship with the Lord. You know that you know, you're kind of lost and kind of doing your own thing. But I want you to know that God loves you, that He created you, and that He sent His Son to die for you. Because we're all imperfect. We all need a Savior. And He sent His Son to be that Savior. If you need a prayer or prayer today to ask the Lord into your life, to have a fresh start, to, to start over, to be forgiven, I would ask you real quick to put your hand up and just say, yeah, I, I want to pray that prayer. Is there anybody here today? You want to pray a prayer. You want to start a fresh, a fresh with God. All right, let's pray one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we honor you and thank you. Lord, we love you. We appreciate your great hand and work in our life. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we're going to celebrate like we never have before. We love you. We praise you and thank you, Lord. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all.